Thank you everybody and hello. It's good to be here and glad to see all of you here for my lecture. If you were here for the opening ceremony this morning, you heard more about me than you ever wanted to know. But nevertheless, let me say a few more things. I got my education at Lehigh University. While I was there, I worked with some of the, the real pioneers in fracture mechanics, like uh, George Irwin, Paul Paris, and uh, you'll hear those names during my lecture from time to time. Uh, after I got the education at Lehigh, I worked at Westinghouse Research Center in Pittsburgh, and I was there 15 years in a group that was devoted to fracture and fatigue uh, exclusively. While I was there, my daughter Rebecca was born there, and uh, when we moved later, after 15 years, we moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, and she went back to Pittsburgh because people who are born in Pittsburgh get drawn right back to Pittsburgh. Um, so after I left Westinghouse, I worked at University of Tennessee for about 25 to 30 years. And after a while, they got tired of having old people around. So they said, why don't you retire? And then I retired. Um, nevertheless, I still do some teaching at local community colleges. And they hadn't gotten tired of me yet. So. Um, I thought I would show you something, it got it stuck. Hey there, it's unstuck. Uh, thank you. This is not my laptop, so I'm not quite used to it, but I wanted to show you something. Here's a map of Tennessee. For those of you who aren't familiar with the United States, uh, this is in the southeast. And we, we are in Knoxville. I'll have to go back. We are in Knoxville, this area right here. In that area, there's, uh, weather is a little bit colder than here. There's a lot of uh, diverse people there. You see Oak Ridge here. At Oak Ridge is a, a national lab with a lot of research. Knoxville has the University of Tennessee. And so a lot of highly educated people. Uh, and in the area is Smoky Mountains and a lot of mountain areas here. And the other side of the thing is the mountain people. Uh, mountain people are sometimes called rednecks. If you're a mountain person, you need to have long hair and a long beard. Um, you can tell if you're a real redneck if you are sitting in your rocking chair and a bird comes along and builds a nest in your beard, you're, you're known as a real uh, redneck. And you're also known that it's probably time to get off the rocking chair after that happens. Uh, we, we get along with both. Uh, they speak a different language, but we've gotten used to it. Uh, show you a little bit here. This is what the city of Knoxville looks like. There's about 200,000 people. In, in the city itself and more around the, the area. So that, that uh, is a little bit of where we come from. Now, if we can get back to the main course. I want to say a few things before I start on the lecture. There's not a real big group, so I want to keep this as a teaching session rather than a formal lecture. So anytime anybody has a question during the conduct of, of uh, my lecture, uh, stop and we'll try to answer that question. If I don't know the answer, I'll either make it up or say I don't know. Uh, the other thing is it's right after lunch and it's warm here. If you get really tired, put your head down and take a nap, but try not to snore. This is a little bit of the outline. Uh, normally, we're supposed to go two to three, take that two-letter break, the P and T break, or vice versa, and then uh, start off again after everybody is well teed. Um, back to the thing again. So this will be. Uh, how it goes. I'm not sure that I'll keep right on the schedule I have here if 
not, it's, it's quite okay. The first week I have more important stuff than the second week. So uh, if you want to nap, try, try napping next week uh, more than this week. <clears throat> These are all the days. I didn't want you to memorize it. One of the things we have in fracture mechanics is nomenclature. Um, eventually, I want to get a handout for everybody so that you'll have this. The nomenclature, again, is not something to go through, but something I always give to students when I do this course so that they can go back. We have a lot of nomenclature. It's not unique. Sometimes the same term has different symbols. Sometimes the same ha symbol has different terms. But there's a lot of nomenclature, the Roman alphabet, the Greek alphabet, and here are the K solutions that we'll get to. Also, I have in here some reference books. If you work in fracture mechanics, you might be interested in what kind of textbooks to have. I was going to bring along some examples, and when I picked them up, they weighed more than my clothing, so I didn't bring them because I thought I'd rather be dressed than have the books. And so uh, show you some of the ones. When I teach a fracture mechanics course at the university, I use this as a textbook, Ted Anderson. It has the most uh, comprehensive linear elastic, nonlinear things. And this is a case solution book that we'll talk a lot about. Uh, here's one of a colleague of mine with uh, Saxena, who is Indian, and we worked together for a number of years. He's now, uh, he, well, he's, I think, Dean Emeritus, but he was Dean of Engineering at University of Arkansas. And this book has a lot of fatigue stuff, so if you're interested in fatigue, Norman Dowling. He was also a colleague of mine. Both of these worked with me at uh, Westinghouse. Some journals. Um, course objectives. You should learn the importance of using a fracture mechanics approach. Understand some of the basic principles. Learn to do how you do testing and analysis and so solve some basic life problems. Uh, if you can't remember all this stuff, you should learn how you can get help from people. I do a lot of paper reviewing and a lot of the papers I review are written here in India, so you have quite an active group of people working in fracture and fatigue here in India, so often see that. And you're only beaten maybe by the Chinese. So uh, a little bit of introduction. This first whole lecture is kind of what I call arm waving stuff. I didn't mention it, but my background is more in the mechanics side than in the material side. So I, I tend to be mechanics oriented. And this is uh, not real mechanics stuff, but just arm waving definitions and things. The definition that we often give for fracture mechanics is a technology that deals with effective defects on load bearing capacities of materials and structures. And we assume that there may be defects in the materials. And if you have defects in the material, the approach you use to predicting failure uh, that doesn't consider the defect might not be adequate. Here's a little schematic that I use. What we teach the undergraduates is the conventional approach. For those of you in engineering, you of course know you have strength of materials courses. In strength of materials, you learn how to calculate stresses in all kinds of bodies and then once you calculate those stresses, you can look at failure depending on a stress value like yield strength or ultimate tensile strength or maybe strain. But that doesn't consider what happens when there's a defect in the material. When there's a defect in the material, then you should use the fracture mechanics approach, which puts together the stress and the defect size into a term called fracture toughness. So in this approach, the defect is considered. Now, here are a lot of types of defects, but in fracture mechanics, at least mathematically, we assume the defect is a sharp crack. And um, so I want to do some apologetics, which is tell you why uh, fracture mechanics is necessary from maybe two points of view. One is economic and the other is safety. From the economic point of view, this study was done almost 35 years ago. 
1982 and found that the cost of failures in USA in 1982 was more than $132 billion a year. Now, if you convert that to rupees, I don't know if I could do that in my head, but it's probably more rupees than you can count. So that's cost of failures is a lot. The study also found that if people would use the newer technology, um, they could save at least 50% of that cost. Now, back in 1982, fracture mechanics was a newer technology. But in a lot of industrial centers, it still is uh, a new technology. Not everybody is using it yet, so uh, people are, are learning more and more about it. And um, I, I do short courses on this around the US and always have a lot of students who are interested in, in learning this for their industry. The other part of the need for fracture mechanics is safety. And we like to talk about failure. Can't give any, any uh, lecture in fracture mechanics without going back and talking about historical failures. And some of them seem a little humorous today, but they weren't probably at the time weren't too humorous. Here's one of the real classics was the Boston molasses tank failure. This occurred in about 1919, so almost 100 years ago, in the city of Boston. There was a molasses tank that burst, and a wave of molasses came. It's, for those of you who do, do meters, it was at least 15 meters high, maybe higher than 15 meters, or five meters, sorry, 15 feet to 20 feet high, and it came at a high velocity and just swept everything away. Killed uh, scores of people and horses. Now, I talked about molasses tank failure for a, quite a while. Nobody knew at the time why it failed and uh, can't really go back and study it. But I was wondering, why have a molasses tank in the middle of a big city like Boston? And found out that the molasses tank was there for the brewery. They were using it to make a beverage, and apparently um, they didn't make a beverage for a while after that happened. Here's another type of failure. This is a barge that broke, but it's not what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about Liberty ships. Uh, you perhaps don't know U.S. history, but in U.S. history, the World War II started, and they couldn't get supplies to the European front fast enough because there weren't enough ships. So they started building these things called Liberty ships. The Liberty ships were a whole new design. It was completely welded rather than riveted pieces together. They welded it so it was like one big structure uh, and um, they built them fast. I saw a video one time that showed how they built one complete ship from nothing but metal laying around on the floor to a whole complete ship in about four days. So that's, uh, I don't think we could do it anymore. You probably can't call somebody up and get an answer back in four days, but they built the ship in four days. And they built many of these ships. They built more than 2,000. And as they started to sail across the North Atlantic where the water was cold, some of the, the ships uh, failed. And of more than 2,000 ships, some 400 had bad cracking problems, or cracking problems, some 90 bad cracking problems, and some 20 of them had complete failure. Complete failure was a little bit like the Titanic. If you've seen the Titanic movie that came around about 10 years ago or so, and people saw that, how it broke in half and went into the water, these went down quicker. They didn't have a lot of actors there sort of dragging out the failure, but broken to, whoomp, down in the ocean. You can imagine being on su such a ship, you would have been very disappointed in, in the design and, and building of that ship, uh, albeit for a short time maybe, but a lot of failures. After they thought about it was a materials problem, nobody knew about fracture mechanics, and they solved it by using the Sharpie impact test. Uh, those of you in, in materials know the Sharpie impact test. If they s found if they had a material that had more than 10 foot-pounds of energy, it was maybe 13-some joules, it was safe. And so they used that. But 
the important thing about these failures where the Navy got very concerned about failures and fracture and the initial uh, modern fracture mechanics approach started with George Irwin who worked at Naval Research Lab in Washington DC. So this got the Navy thinking about fracture and really, really uh, helped push that technology on. Some more failures, these are a list of them. Here's one, I'll show you more when it comes to fatigue. This is a failure of a, of a 737 airplane. It was Aloha Airlines in the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, when they were flying due to a fatigue problem, the top just came right off of the fuselage. And people were riding in what we would call a convertible airplane. Now, in the US, when people have enough money, they get a real expensive car that's a convertible where the top comes down and they ride around with their head sticking out their hair blowing in the wind, and they really enjoy that a lot. The people on this airplane, when the top came off, didn't enjoy it one bit. Um, the good thing about this was that the pilot was able to land it with only one fatality. Uh, the fatality was, I think, was a flight attendant who wasn't buckled in. So a good reason when you're flying, keep your seatbelt on in case the top comes off. You don't want to go flying out just no fun at all. So that's another thing we'll talk about when we hit fatigue a little bit. Here was one uh, failure that was well known and this was a bridge collapse in the US, Point Pleasant Bridge between Ohio and West Virginia, kind of in the northeast area and it was due to an environmental cracking problem. We'll talk about environmental cracking uh, later on in the week. And this happened in the winter, in December, just before our Christmas holiday. It was a big uh, disaster, and people involved with this, uh, many people were killed because they had cars on that that fell into the river, and it was a, a, a real tragedy for these people. So this is environmental effects in cracking, causing that bridge collapse. This is not the bridge, but this is about what it looked like before a failure, here is pieces that, that were failed. Uh, one last failure, I think, to talk about, NASA rocket motor casing. Uh, NASA is our National Aeronautics and Space Administration in the US, responsible for putting rockets into the air. What happened is that in the US in the 1950s, people talked about one day putting some thing into space. And then suddenly, the, the Soviet Union put the Sputnik up. Sputnik first thing, and everybody in the US panicked. And they got, got real busy and say, we got to beat the Soviet Union. We can't let them be ahead of us in the space race. So they started building these sort of things very fast. And they built them of materials that had fracture problems sometimes. So some of these rockets blew up. And because of that, NASA got involved in fracture mechanics and was very instrumental in developing testing techniques and, and the like. So that helped, all, all of these failures helped push the, the need for fracture mechanics along. Uh, I think this is, yeah, that's all the failures. This is the person we call the father of fracture mechanics, George Irwin. Uh, he was at Lehigh University while I was there for a little while. And he was uh, involved with fracture mechanics. He, he developed the basic uh, stress approach to fracture, and whenever, um, whenever I had students that went to a conference, they always wanted to know if Dr. Irwin would be there. If he was there and the students gave a, a lecture, he always came up and congratulated them. He worked in fracture mechanics area until he was about 90, and he passed away then some months later, continued working until his death. Here's one last thing about advantages of fracture mechanics. It's a quantitative analysis. You can get actual numbers out of this instead of saying qualitatively it's, it's okay or it's not okay. You get actual numbers about this. You can pick out structural life, design safety factors, and inspection criteria. The three areas that we combined, I'll show you a lot uh, during these lectures, the defect size, the stresses, 
and the material properties. So this kind of brings together the mechanics people, the metallurgists, and the non-destructive in inspection people. Okay, I'm going to go start the next segment. The, my lectures don't last exactly at one hour each. They are somewhat varied, so I'll find a nice stopping place when it comes time for that break. But I have to figure out this computer. Okay. So that's the arm waving part where you hear the stories about failures and all the bad things that happen. Uh, the fracture mechanics itself requires some analysis. So I want to talk a little bit about analytical techniques and in this lecture. So start out with the very first fracture theory, which is the Griffiths fracture theory. It was based on energy balance and he developed that in the 1920s but never really went anywhere because the energy balance uh, approach was a little bit complicated and clumsy and so people uh, just never got anywhere with it but uh, mentioned that his theory was this take a plate that is stressed by actually and this is a two-dimensional sort of a two-dimensional thin plate it has a defect size 2a it has stresses by axial, as I said, and then he developed the energy of this. So the potential energy of that plate had three terms, and the first term, U0, was potential energy with no crack. Um, UA was potential energy change due to the introduction of the crack, the 2A crack, and this solution came from an elastician named Inglis and said this is really what would allow Griffiths to develop his theory. Anyway, sigma is stress, biaxial stress. A, of course, is the half defect size. T is the thickness of the plate, and E is elastic modulus. So all those terms come in. And notice that the potential energy due to the introduction of a crack is negative. So if you start with this potential energy and introduce a crack, the, the total potential energy goes down. And then the other energy term is the development of new surface. So the surface energy term has this, 4A times T times uh, capital T. Uh, capital T is sort of a surface traction term. Uh, 4A because you have 2A crack length and you have a top and a bottom. So you have a top surface, a bottom surface, and a thickness gives the total area times the surface traction uh, term. Then if you add them all together, you get total energy like that. Now if you take advanced mechanics of, of materials and, and courses like that, you learn that you can use an energy approach for equilibrium. The energy approach does this. You take the first derivative of the energy with respect to the variable and set it equal to zero and that gives you the equilibrium uh, position. So the equilibrium position is this. And if you take a second derivative and get a negative value, which you would see if you take a second derivative with respect to crack length, you'd get a negative value, then that equilibrium is unstable. Stable equilibrium is like having a ball in a dish. You push it up the side and it rolls back to where it was. Unstable is like having it at the other end of the dish. It's, sit, it's stable on top, you move it away and it keeps rolling away. So that's, that's unstable equilibrium. Now that was the Griffiths approach. And he said this is what you need to cause fracture. It's a little bit clumsy. Uh, the people who work with Griffiths, and, and it's still a valuable thing, especially when you have materials that are not homogeneous and isotropic. Nevertheless, the Griffiths G was labeled like this. And later, uh, George Irwin came along and uh, showed how this was related to 
corrective stress intensity factor. So the Griffiths approach came in 1920s. The, the new approach from Irwin came in 1950s, so more than a 30-year gap between those two. And uh, some of those failures I showed you were the important in developing that, so uh, that, that was an important thing. Now, the Irwin approach is a stress intensity factor approach based on stress rather than energy. And he showed that if you have a cracked tip, and look at the stresses around the cracked tip, and, and this is two-dimensional, X direction, Y direction, uh, normal stresses, and then shear stress, uh, tau XY. That element then is at a distance R from the cracked tip, and at some angle theta from the horizontal. So those terms all come into his stress analysis terms. Now before you look at them, you have to talk about the modes of loading there are three modes of loading. One is uh, opening mode, and um, opening mode has all the loads and stresses perpendicular to the crack. Uh, mode two is in plane shear. The loads are parallel to the crack, loads and stresses, but um, they are in the plane. And mode three is uh, out of plane shear. The, the stresses and loads, again, are parallel to the crack but they're out of the plane tearing the thing. Uh, this is what people used to use in the old days when they wanted to tear up the New York City uh, phone directory. I don't know why they wanted to do that, but some people did. So you use a mode three approach. 90% of what we talk about in fracture mechanics is mode one, opening mode. Seems to be the most damaging. Mode two comes of interest. Um, if you are familiar with research, what happens in research, People uh, study something, they write papers on it, and then if it's not a real popular subject that sits around, 15 years later people come along and study the same thing and write the same papers. So there's this every 15 year cycle, people doing the same work over and over again. And um, well, that, that's, that's the way that, that one goes. Anyway, back to mode one. For mode one loading, at the tip of the crack, the stresses look like this. Not something that you should memorize. Nevertheless, the important thing here is that these stresses have a unique distribution. The distribution terms are the distance r from the crack tip and the uh, angle from the horizontal theta. So these distributional terms are unique. No matter how you load, what geometry there is, if it's mode one loading, you always get the same stress terms. And that was an important thing in the fracture mechanics. Uh, the, the important parameter then is the K, and George Irwin called that crack tip stress intensity factor. That is the term that relates the boundary loading to the crack tip stress and gives the magnitude of the stresses around the, the crack tip. So, in the stress analysis, the two main features are the K, the magnitude term. It's an indicator of what happens in fracture, fatigue, and whatever. And then the distribution terms are unique um, for mode one. So K has an important role, and we're going to get into Ks in, in this lecture. So here's kind of how uh, the terms look. The, the stress in the Y direction has a K. And in these terms, uh, square root of 2 pi r, r being the distance from the crack tip, and a bunch of theta functions, these, all these theta functions. In doing fracture mechanics, then, uh, people look at the area around the crack tip as a black box. Because there is a unique distribution, there, there is a zone around the crack tip characterized by k that tells you what's going to happen. That zone is not given a size, but just, just as the area around the crack tip. And the magnitude of the field then given by K, and the magnitude of that field tells you what fracture you would get, whether you're going to have uh, fracture toughness, failure, uh, fatigue failure, or environmental effects. However, um, when Irwin developed that approach based on stress, Griffiths also had the energy balance approach, and 
so George Irwin did this. He showed that the Griffiths term was related to the K. So whether you use the Griffiths approach or a K approach, you have the, essentially the same analysis. However, in most analyses, it's much easier to calculate stresses than it is energy. People use uh, theory of elasticity or numerical methods to calculate stresses, and then, then it's easier to calculate those stresses. So here is what you can do with the K approach. It's kind of the real basic uh, fracture mechanics theory. You can go in the laboratory and use a specimen. A lot of our specimens look like this. In the laboratory, you use that specimen, and then if whatever fracture event happens to that specimen, you can relate that directly to the structure. And this, this is representative of laboratory specimen. This is re related to the structure itself. And this is the transfer term then. So the K and the K field is the transfer from laboratory to structure. So here's in some words about what I just said. Uh, we use the crack tip field approach. And the magnitude of that depends on K. And the, the boundary loading relates to crack tip stress field through K. So we call this phenomenological, meaning that it's the field reaching a critical value rather than a mechanism. So you don't say you get failure when stress hits a certain value, strain hits a certain value, but rather when K hits a certain value. <clears throat> so in order to predict, predict failure, K is a real important term to, uh, to use. The type of failures can talk about then fracture toughness, which is failure under a monotonically increasing load, failure due to fatigue, which is under cyclic load, failure due to stress corrosion cracking, which is uh, the combination of a bad environment with stress and cracks, and then if you work on high temperatures, Sometimes people worry about creep cracking. Here are some reasons for doing applications. The, the two main ones are to set design criteria, and the other one to set material selection. Um, anybody who's not very good at one and two often ends up doing number three, which is failure analysis. So failure analysis is a fairly big topic and can be approached with a fracture mechanics point of view. We put the different uh, areas that are involved in fracture mechanics on a triangle. And they are the defect size from the non-destructive people, the stress analysis from the mechanics or mechanical engineering, and then the material properties from the metallurgists and material scientists. They all go together through K, the crack tip stress intensity factor. The life prediction can be done this way for fatigue or, or a corrosion, that you could initiate a crack or have a pre-existing crack, and that could grow due to some subcritical crack growth mechanism and then reach a final size. So in, in my lectures during this week, I will show you how to put that all together. So due to this, K is the, the most important thing to, to develop, and we want to talk about finding K for, uh, for the analysis and the things we're going to learn. So here are some of the methods that, that we have used. Uh, in the beginning, people used closed form analysis, theory of elasticity, but that was fairly limited. Nowadays, numerical, like finite element, is used a lot but more than anything is a handbook approach. And I have, everybody has these uh, fracture handbooks with case solutions in them. <clears throat> There's something that I'll show you, uh, some of the important parts of that. Here are some of the case solutions uh, that, that you would use. There are essentially two formulas, and these are sometimes confusing people. One is given, if you're given a stress uh, for a material
material, then stress sigma, square root of pi a, and a function of the geometry. F of a over w does not mean f times a over w, but means a function of a over w. The other one is if you're given mainly the load, then you use uh, the load, the little f, and these terms. B here is thickness, out of, out of plane w is the planar width, and a is crack length. So those two approaches, I call them the capital F approach and the little f approach, and they are, they are both uh, important things. This is more used in structural analysis. This is more used in uh, experimental work and, and laboratory work and things. Here are the, the uh, units used. In most of my things, I, in the US, I usually use engineering or English units. Um, I changed most of the problems that I could to SI for you, but I didn't do all of them because some of them were on graphs that I couldn't change. So you, you should learn both of these. Uh, KSI, square root of inch, for engineering or English units, and for the SI units, MPA, square root of meter. Sometimes people ask me, uh, what is a square root of an inch? Because they know an inch is length, inch squared is area, and so forth. But what's a square root of an inch? It doesn't make any sense. And I tell them, uh, use it long enough, you'll get used to it. And you'll never ask again, what, what's a square root of an inch? It just, just is. Here is that analysis, the handbook uh, terms. And in this, I have some things I'll show you. One of the important uh, geometries is the center crack specimen. It's like the Griffiths geometry. Now, uh, this was done by Paris Irwin and somebody named Tata. Tata was a Japanese student. Uh, when I was at Lehigh, he came to work with Paul Paris. And when I first met him, he could hardly speak any English. And then I met him again 30 years later, and he could hardly speak any English. So he spent all his time in the US stuck in an office developing these solutions for Paul Paris and never learning to speak much English. But uh, it didn't matter. Anyway, he developed most of these solutions. Paul Paris and George Irwin had their name on this. And, and this is one of the handbooks. There are others. I always use this handbook, and the reason I always use this one, it's the only one I have. So it makes it a lot easier to use it if you have it. Um, so here's, here's one of the geometries. And the, the center crack has 2A crack length, 2B for width. Now, we normally use capital W for width. But Tata, for some reason, uh, used 2B. And you can't explain to them. Uh, don't use 2B because he hardly speaks any English. And um, so you just have to get used to that, the difference. In that, then, this is the capital F approach, sigma, square root of pi A, and capital F function. The capital F function is given graphically or in a table. And the graphical solution is not the capital F itself, but it's normalized. I have handouts for you. I'm going to hand out some of these solutions, but I'll go over them a little bit. Um, this one has a lot of work on it. People develop formulas for uh, different capital S for the same thing and did a lot of work on this. And um, so, so there were a lot of choices for solutions. Now, the one is used a lot is this one called modification of Federson formula. Uh, now, Federson is um, a f person who was involved with fracture mechanics back in the 1970s. He was, came to about every meeting. And one, one uh, time, he came to a meeting with his hair dyed all funny color. And he said, guess what I did? I just bought a casino in Las Vegas. And I'm going to give up fracture mechanics and go into casino business. And I never saw him again. So I, I
took from that that casino in Las Vegas pays better than fracture mechanics. But nevertheless, this is his legacy. His formula is the main one used here for, for this. Some others in the uh, handbook, and, and there's hundreds of them. Here's uh, an important one, single edge crack. Single edge crack uh, is essentially the central crack where you take a line down the middle and cut it in half. And cutting it in half then relaxes the, the boundary here a little bit, so it changes the solution considerably, uh, namely point out this, that when you have a central crack and you get a very small crack compared to the, to the width, we say that A over B, it tends towards zero. The F function tends towards 1.0. In, in an edge crack, when you have a very short crack and this tends towards zero, in the limit, capital F tends towards 1.122. So cutting it down the middle relaxes that line, causes the, the K to go up a little bit, and um, the other thing here, point out that, that whereas this has a table, this does not have a table, but rather it has um, just a graph. And that, that graph is a little bit hard for some students to use because it's normalized. The reason it's normalized is to make this curve flatter. If you don't normalize it, it would go off to very high numbers quickly. But with that, it's normalized and it's, it's much flatter. Some of the others that we won't use much, but I'll just show you uh, single edge crack without, with bending rather than tension, and in the limit it tends to 1.122. All edge cracks in the limit of a small crack compared to the width tends to 1.122, and all center cracks tend to 1.0. Some of the solutions from the handbook that we won't use just to show you how complicated they look. Here's a, an example, a crack approaching a hole on one side and then an empty plate on the other. So you have the solution for the A side and the B side being different and all these crisscrosses of curves. Okay, I think I will take a break here. It's about break time. And we'll come back and talk about the fracture toughness uh, and maybe hand out some stuff. So let's take that break, the classical two-letter break, and come back at, try to come back at 3.30 so we can get back on time. What I would like is for everybody to get a copy of my slides so we decided that they will be put in PDF file. And then if you can upload them, you will have a chance to upload all those slides. Uh, they'll be important in the future. We're going to have a little quiz at the end, and uh, it's open book, so you should use everything there. Um, as an engineer, we don't work from memory. Engineers usually work from books and charts and all kinds of stuff, so I never give an, a little quiz to have people work from memory because it just it goes against engineering. Now, showed you some case solutions for typical structural element types, and th they're in that handbook. Now, besides the handbook are the case solutions for various geometries that are people use in, in testing. I have fracture toughness testing, but almost all the kinds of testing I'll talk about use specimens that look like this. And this is a single edge bend specimen, and this is a compact specimen. The single edge bend is in three-point bending and has the uh, span, this S distance, to the planar width, W, of um, four to one. For the most part, I use ASTM nomenclatures, which uses W for width, and skip that data B, but not always. Anyway, the uh, solutions for K have this F function, which is a real bad polynomial. Now, if 
you're going to use calculate that polynomial all the time, it's a pain in the neck for number one. Number two, I never go through it and get the right answer because I make a mistake somewhere along the line. So I did print out this table. This is this f function printed out um, in a table. Now, if you rearrange this, take b squared to w times k and then divide that by p. So b k squared to w divided by p is a little f function. So it's this column, it's a little f function. Started with a over w, which a over w is the, in this specimen, the crack length from the center of the pinholes to the tip of the crack. Here it's from the edge of the specimen to the tip of the crack, and then w is the width here, w. center of the pinholes to the back of the specimen is the W. So rather than using that polynomial all the time, that's convenient if you have a computer controlled test system, you just put it in, into the test system, but if you're doing things by hand like we'll be doing, it's much more convenient to have that table. So I've handed out this whole table. This is for K calibration for the C comma T uh, in in fracture mechanics, that's called the compact specimen. So I'll show you. I have that whole table. It goes from A over W, a 0.2 all the way to 0.99. And then I have some other tables. This is for the center crack. You can use again that that form, and then also for single edge tension. You can use that, or you can use the capital F form for both of those. For the compact specimen, there is no capital F form. It doesn't make any sense. Now, the capital F form and the little f form are related. I just done the, the, the uh, schematic. So you can see if you take the stress is load divided by the area, B is thickness, W is um, width. When we do K calculations, you're always calculating stress before the crack is in place. So you're taking a specimen like this, whoops, like this, and assuming there's no crack in place and doing doing then the stress calculation for that. And then um, put that here for stress, take the W and divide it into two square root parts, and then this whole thing here is the little f. So the little f is that whole thing. So they're, they're essentially the same thing. However, if you start with stress, it's easier to use the capital F form. And if you start with load, P here is the load, it's easier to use the little f form. <coughs> Those solutions I showed you are two-dimensional solutions. And for most uh, two-dimensional bodies where the crack goes all the way through, you assume that the crack front is straight and then the K is the same all the way along that crack front. Many of the structural cracks, though, are three-dimensional or are not straight through. So I'll show you some of those. Here's one a little hard to imagine. It's called penny-shaped crack. It's just a round circle crack embedded in this material, and here's the K solution for that. It has always has that form stress and square root of crack length, but sometimes it has different things out front. Now here is the most common 3D crack called the elliptical flaw. The elliptical flaw um, has a major axis of 2C and a minor axis of 2A. So this ellipse is embedded in that specimen. Uh, again, you can see this is mode 1. It's pulled per load stress perpendicular to the crack. So it has the form sigma squared of pi a, and there's a q factor here, and there's also a phi, a little phi factor. The phi is the, the angle from the horizontal. So as phi is 0, it would put you right here. And as you get to 90 degrees, you would be right there. 
So the K itself changes as you go along the crack front in an elliptical flaw. Most often, though, this elliptical flaw is cut in half, and you get the semi-elliptical flaw. Now, this is looking from top down here after you cut the thing in half, semi-elliptical flaw, so that the major axis is still 2C, and this is a semi-minor axis to the ellipse. And you have then this K solution. You pick up the 1.122 factor out front, that is for all surface flaws, and the depth then A, the surface length 2C, phi again is the angle from the horizontal. And so you need a Q factor, and this is an approximate Q factor. Okay, here is some um, K calculation examples. I don't have the table of things right handy, but say you want to calculate K for a compact using that table. You need some geometry things, and, and these are unfortunately in um, engineering units. So the width is 2 inches, the B is 1 inch, A is 1.2 inches, and load P is, is 8 kips. Um, sorry, I have to go back to the picture. And B is thickness, 1 inch, the W is 2 inches. The A is 1.2 inches is here. So back to this. First thing you have to do then is take the crack length to width ratio, A over W. 1.2 over 2 is point 0 0.6. You can go then to the table, look up 0 0.6. 0 0.6 is right here, and this is the F for that, 13.65, rounded off, so using 13.65 for, for the uh, F. So you put those all together, load 8, little f, 13.65, thickness B is 1, W is square root of 2, get 77, is the case solution for that case. You will, you will have to do a lot of K calculations, so you should try to get used to it as quickly as you can. Here's another example. The picture of the center crack. I used 2B because that's what uh, Tata used. 2B is 10 inches, 2A is 2 inches, stress is 50. First thing is get A over B is 1 over 5 is 0.2. And then, again, 0.2 back to this. I can pick that off the table, 1.0246. 1 so 1.2046, round off to 1.205, stress 50, square root of pi, uh, square root of crack length is all under the radical, and then the capital F is out front, you get a number 90.8. So that's K calculation for a center crack using the picture. Question? The the slide. Okay. Penny 
cliche. You want to see that picture? Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I, I didn't do any examples for him, but... Elliptical flow, yeah. Yeah. It's it's higher when it's ninety degrees, unless it's a round circle where A and C are one. If this is one, then you get that that identity sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. So this thing goes away, and you just have that. That that goes to one too. Yeah, uh, you can explain why when pi equals ninety, there is a higher given. In in elliptical crack, when you are closer to the kind of the center, you get higher k's. Yeah. It's just a mechanics thing. I don't know physically you can say anything else. It's just a mechanics thing. But the closer you get to the center, as you go from the distance out here and get closer and closer to the center, the k increases. It keeps going up and up. So a lot of times with an elliptical crack or a semi-elliptical crack, sorry, people just worry about that point right there, the k right there, because it is the highest k. Could, could be, yeah. I think if, if you take this thing and pull on it, it's, it's really not intuitive because the longer the crack, the higher the K. So you're saying, oh, that's the shorter distance, not the longer distance. K should be higher here, but it's not. Yeah, so it's counterintuitive, I'd say. If you want to think intuitively. Um, I don't know what else to say about it. It just, that, that's the way it is. Other questions about these? Now, yeah, right at the short point is yeah. When you pull on it, does that seem intuitively so? Not necessarily. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, it would yeah, but yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. So. We'll come back to this again sometime, but yeah. Okay, y you know how to calculate k's now. This is not the end of it. I have a short. Now oh, come on. I'm not good on this computer. I have a short thing I want to show you, and then I'll get you a chance to have your own of doing this. Before we talk about testing, I wanted to show you um, two problems that come up in our fracture mechanics, which I call crack tip plasticity and R curve behavior. Now, if you think about fracture, you learned about the Griffiths G and the Irwin K. If K would get to a critical fracture or critical value to cause fracture, ideally then you would just get the body to come into two pieces, like dropping a glass on the floor or something, bang, there's more, one or two or more pieces. And so ideally, you want to load the specimen keep a track of K, K gets to a sudden point, then you get an unstable failure. Uh, we said from the Griffiths point of view, 
that you would get that unstable failure because it's, it's an unstable equilibrium. Anyway, two problems come and cause difficulty with this, and they are the crack tip plasticity and the arc curve behavior. And before you can do any testing, you have to deal with those two difficulties. Um, first thing, look at the crack tip stress, and you see this, 1 over square root of r, and r, remember, is the distance from the crack tip to the stress element. So as the stress element gets closer and closer to the crack tip, you get what's called a singularity, 1 over square root of r singularity. So as r gets close to 0, the stress goes to infinity. Now you would think that infinite stress then should cause failure, but that's not necessarily so. It doesn't because real materials, especially metals, can't abide very high stresses. When you get very high stresses, you get plasticity. So real materials get plasticity. So at the crack tip, when you have this and get close to the crack tip, you get a plastic zone. And show you this. So at the crack tip there, this is the, the stress analysis as you get close to the crack tip, and it gives you a plastic zone. If the plastic zone is small enough, it's contained by the K-field, and the K-field dominates. But when the plastic zone gets too big, the K no longer can dominate, and so it's not a good parameter anymore. So you can only use the K approach uh, with when the plasticity is, is sort of under control. Uh, when it's under control, we K call that behavior uh, linear elastic fracture mechanics. So the whole stress analysis of Irwin is a linear elastic f stress analysis, and to use it, you need essentially linear elastic behavior. Now to calculate the size of the plastic zone, you can do this. Say that the Y stress, K over square root of 2 pi R, and we're taking it where theta is 0, so when theta is 0, the, all the theta functions go to 1, and then set that equal to the yield strength. Sigma sub ys in, in our nomenclature stands for the yield stress. And then rearrange this, and then you get the ry, it's the size of the plastic zone, has this character, 1 over square root of 2 pi, k over the yield strength quantity squared. This uh, size of plastic zone is the one we most often use. It's usually called the plain stress plastic zone. If you have plain strain, which we'll, we'll talk more about later, but means a more of a thickness constraint, a very thick structure, the plastic zone can be smaller and can have a 1 over 6 pi. So you go from 1 over 2 pi to 1 over 6 pi. And the reason we picked 1 over 6 pi is because one time George Irwin said, I think you ought to use 1 over 6 pi for plain strain. And everybody said, yeah, we ought to use 1 over 6 pi. So ever after that, we've used 1 over 6 pi. However, when in doubt, use 1 over 2 pi. So here, schematically, is what happens. You get a little plastic zone, the K zone, which is the zone of where all the action's taking place, the black box, dominates that plasticity and the plastic zone doesn't cause any problem. However, if the plastic zone gets too big, then it wipes out the K-zone, and with the small plastic zone, they have what we call linear elastic fracture mechanics. It's valid here. Big plastic zone, it's no longer valid. Now, how big is too big? All of the test methods have this built in automatically. So that automatically gets built in. And you don't say up front how big is too big, but each test method, depending on what it is, has a different number for that, or, or may have a different number. So it can vary from one test method to another. So here's another way to tell that you have too much plasticity. If you have uh, load and you measure displacement somewhere on the specimen, and you get essentially a straight line, then you know it's essentially linear elastic behavior. 
so you know you're, you're in this condition, small plastic zone. If you're loading and you get grossly nonlinear load and displacement, then you have lost the linear elastic behavior, and we often call that elastic plastic fracture behavior. So another way to tell, besides the plastic zone, is load and displacement. Almost all the tests have load and displacement measurement built into the test method, so you can see if you essentially have this or essentially have that. Now the second problem, that, that's the plastic zone problem. So you always have to keep track of the plastic zone size and the amount of plasticity to s tell you whether or not you can use the K approach in your fracture mechanics. The other problem is called the R-curve problem or the duct to fracture problem. What you were kind of hoping is that when you pulled the specimen and got to the failure point, it would fail. Bang! It would come into two parts. But many materials, many metals, are ductile and have a fracture process that doesn't involve breaking suddenly into two pieces. It kind of goes like this. You start with a sharp crack when you have no load. As you begin loading, that sharp crack can blunt. As you load some more, ahead of the blunted crack, you develop another sharp crack which can, can grow uh, in a stable manner. So this whole process can be stable and what then is the difficulty is where do you say fracture occurs? Of course it doesn't occur there and maybe it's occurred already here but you have to be able then to pick a point that you say this point is the fracture point. And that again is built into the test methods. So our curve behavior, fracture does not occur at a single point, but rather crack extends in a stable manner. So people mostly plot then a fracture parameter versus crack extension and, and form an R curve. Typically for linear elastic fracture, you would use K as a fracture parameter. Delta A is the change in crack length is plotted as, as the crack advance. So here, here's an example R curve. Uh, you can ignore this for the time being, but it looks like this. This is crack extension delta A would be the current crack length versus the initial crack length. This is essentially this, and that, that's an R curve plot. And so you have to be able to pick a point, and in the K1C test, the point you pick is here. Let me show you this next uh, thing. Uh, this is the most exciting part for you. I want you to do a little problem to determine the case. Now you still have a half hour, so you have time to work on this, and I guess I'll go over the solution next time, but you should work then uh, in determining the K. Which, three, three examples here. For the compact specimen, these are the W's. These are all in kilonewtons and millimeters, so SI units here. Two sizes of, of compact specimen and one center crack. So for these initial conditions, calculate the K. Then you should increase the crack length by five millimeters and then recalculate the K. Now here's another one. Use a single edge crack solution with a stress of 200. B or W, whatever you want to call it, 100 millimeters, and crack lengths of these and get K. If you can do those, uh, I'll give you a half hour to work on them. You'll, 
you'll have to learn to calculate your K so that you can go on and do other things because we'll be calculating K's frequently. So everybody has a piece of paper. You have the K solutions. You, you can calculate a K if you want. My wife. Um, I have a calculator here if you don't have one, but it's good to bring one. Does everybody have a calculator or is it some? We don't have yours. Oh, it's down. Yeah. It'll be much better when, yeah. Let me keep this up for quite a while so you can see it, yeah. And, and you have the handout table. That's an important thing. a calculator, here's one. Uh, it's my favorite because it's the only one I have. all work together. If you like the person sitting next to you, you can work together with them. If you don't like them at all, you don't have to work with them. But you may. I thought while you're finishing up in the time remaining, I'd like to go over the solutions for this. But as you're finishing up, let me tell you this problem. Uh, as you probably know, tomorrow we're having an important presidential election in our country. And we thought if things turn out badly, we might try to take a permanent residency in Kuna. Um, <laughs> we're staying in the Marriott. We have beautiful rooms, friendly people, great food, and all the friends here, here and everybody. So the one problem we have, though, is uh, my wife and I and Becky also, we have three cats at home. And while we're home, the cats don't say very much, but I know when we go away, they get together and discuss the problem. Do you think our parents are coming home today? And to solve the problem, I tried to teach them to count. So I took their paws and their fingers, they say one, two, three, four, they have four toes on each paw. And the problem they have is it's only 16 poles and we're going 21 days. Now, I don't know if you ever tried to teach a cat to count, but when they run out of toes, they really get confused. <laughs> they can't do any more. So, well, that, that's our problem. Uh, <laughs> might get us back. Too much.
much. Anyway, I don't know what that little field is. You can go away. Here are some solutions. If you're not finished, you can just follow along. And, and this will take us till the end of our time. Anyway, for the first problem, W is 50, B is 25, A is 25, load is 25, kilonewtons. You've got to make sure you keep the units straight. That's a little problem. But you always start out calculating Ks with A over W. So the crack length to the specimen width ratio is always important because that tells you where to get on the table. Um, here it's simply 0.5. Then if you go to the table, the table value says F is 9.66 rounded off. And um, put that all together. Now, load is 25 kilonewtons. And remember the units MPA root meters. So in order to do that, I put everything in meganewtons and meters. If you're real good with units, you can get away with without doing that, but I, I have trouble. So I put everything in meganewtons. That's uh, the little f is unitless. Then the thickness is 0.025 meters. And this is square root of 0.05 meters. I got 43.2. Now, if you didn't get that to start out, you ought to try it again, because that's what you should get. Anyway, if you change the crack length by 5 millimeters, then the crack size is now 30, A over W is 0.6, and F goes up. Everything else stays the same in the K calculation, but the F goes up. So recalculating that, the crack, the K went up to 61. So you can see just increasing 5 millimeters went from 43 to 61. And, and it's very uh, dependent on crack size. Now, I don't have all the details, but part B is W is 500 and A is 250. So it's just a 10 times planar size specimen and same thickness. And then I got K of 43.7, about the same. Now when I increased crack size 5 millimeters, so 255 millimeters, A over W just goes up to 0.51 and F just goes up a a very small amount, so K went up to 45.1. One point I wanted to make in calculating this is that K increases with crack size. It increases much more quickly when you have a small structure or specimen. Um, it increases much more quickly for a given increment of crack growth than it does on a real big specimen. So this one, K went up almost 50%. Here it only went up a few percent. So, so that's, that's that. Questions on that one? OK, let me show you the other one, which the center crack geometry. The center crack geometry, 2W or 2B is 250. Thickness is 25. 2A is 50 and load is 100. These are all millimeters and kilometers, okay, as I said here. Let me show you the case solution. This you should definitely use that picture. So I have here uh, A25, B or W is 0.5, which is 2W over 2, A over B is 0.2. Then if you read from the table and don't use the graph, F is 1.0246. So now uh, stress, I calculate it before the crack is there as the load. 1 mega newton divided by 0.025 uh, thickness of 0.25 meter square to get stress of 160. Using this uh, K solution is then K 
A is sigma. Well, I'll just do, I'll do it here. I, my battery is gone here. K is sigma 160 squared of pi A. Uh, th this is all under the radical. I didn't have a software to do that, and this is outside the radical. But anyway, 45.9. <coughs> Change the crack length by 0.5. A over B is 0.24. On that table, if you do linear interpolation, that's good enough. You, you don't need to do anything real fancy. So linear interpolation pretty much gets it. And then capital F goes 1.032. That was my linear interpolation. And K went up to 50. So uh, that's about 10% change. So that, that goes up in a medium amount. Uh, discussion on any of these? We'll start out then next time. I have a few more problems, but I think this was enough for today. You, you probably had as much fun as you could stand.